when I brought Hoffman up to our house, this was many years ago, um, I took him to see uh, Jackson's work and to meet Jackson. Um, and to talk to him about his work, one of the first comments that he had, uh, one of the first questions that he had for Pollock uh, was, uh, do you work from nature? There were no models around. There were no still lives, nothing. And Pollock looked back at Hoffman and said, I am nature. I am nature. And so Pollock is associated or known to be the author of process art. Um, and the process in process art refers to the process or the art of formation of an art project. So it's very much about a journey um, more than it is about the end product or a deliverable. Now, in the design disciplines, um, we engage with process as much as we engage with, pro with product. But these processes have to do with lots of functional parameters that we integrate into the design process. And so I'm here to talk about processes, not products. I'm here to talk about methods, not merchandise and systems, not segments. The work that I do is, um, or I'm interested in looking into how nature goes about making things. Um, and in order to do that, I observe natural specimens and I try to understand the relationship between the material and the environment. And it, and it is always that relation to, relationship between substance on the one hand and the environment on the other hand that fascinates me. Um, this here is an eggshell membrane, and it's a beautiful example of nature excellent skills and combining together uh, structure, material, and geometry to cater for both the structural performance, the actual load that is posed on the egg, and also its environmental performance, heat absorption, food transmission, etc. Um, so it's this engagement uh, and relationship between the material and the environment that I try to trace. Um, and when looking back into processes of design prior to the industrial age, um, systems that had to do with craft, for instance, the craft of weaving, uh, were very, very much in tune with this thinking about the actual material properties and the type of operations that we take on, the type of operations that we apply on those materials just through understanding their properties, much like weaving a basket or putting together the form of a nest. But the artist is still a god, and the work of art is still, to some of us, this immaculate conception. With, we start with a vision in our mind, and we think to ourselves, we're going to make this happen. We're going to bring this artwork into reality. Um, and this is Henry Moore chiseling away the two reclining figure for MIT's Killian Court. Unlike the art of form making or the conception of form in an immaculate way, there is another approach, an alternate approach, and that approach is form finding. Um, I'm not the first one to look at form finding procedures. Fry Otto in the 1970s um, in the Institute for Lightweight Structures in Stuttgart is asking, what does a membrane want to be? What does a material want to be? What does a business want to be? So he's trying to understand processes of materials and incorporate those properties. This is the first non-rigid membrane construction for the German Zeppelin. And so here you see sort of the hands-on approach to design versus the hands-off approach desi design, letting material tell its own nar narrative, its own story. How do you do that? This is a bitter melon I've collected last week in the market. I look at natural specimens, and then I reconstruct them in the digital domain, and then bring them back into reality. So it is very much this schizophrenia between the physical domain and the digital domain that I'm engaged in. And this means not only understand how to model a form of a product, a building, a city, a business model, but also thinking about the way in which to incorporate parameters that are related um, to this transition. And this, the, the, the process of design, and also in the world of engineering, right now is very much segregated and highly separated um, as far as the sub-disciplines of modeling simulation and fabrication are concerned. We start by modeling a figure, a form, we then analyze it or optimize it, 
and we then fabricate it. So there's a distinction between all those distinct processes or sub-processes of um, the manifestation of design. Nature, on the other hand, combines all these processes together. And the bone is a great example for a system that combines material modeling, calcium in this case, simulation and fabrication in one system. So when I move to outer space for two weeks, I lose 15% of my bone mass, I regain it upon pregnancy, the bone fabricates itself as it simulates, as it models, as it analyzes in an entirely one integrated system. And so these are the parameters that I work with and every project that I take on, I try to, instead of thinking about the form of what I want to achieve, I'm trying to think about the form of the form of thinking. So lots of diagrams. This is an example of a project I designed for Paolo Antonelli's Design in the Elastic Mind. Um, Paolo is indeed a mentor in, in, my, in my journey. And ray counting was about counting rays, coming up with a structural skin, a skin that can both sustain itself structurally, but also let light through. So it thickens where it has to stabilize itself, and it's very, very thin where it lets, lets light through or heat absorption, et cetera. And so the idea is basically to generate a tool or a process that would allow the designer to pick certain solutions and eliminate others, much like in evolutionary theory. And so certain, certain products or certain specimens are more fitting to certain contextual parameters. And so the design becomes generative in that way. Another example is monocoque, the structural skin a different uh, prototype for a structural skin that is 3D printed um, using two types of materials, a very stiff material, this black material, and a very soft material that lets light through also um, is the white material. And the idea is that those vein-like looking structures modify their thickness to adapt to the type of load. So again, the algorithm allows you to work with highly customizable products. So what happens when we move from art products or projects to design? The chaise lounge that I designed for Seville Art Biennale was um, such an endeavor where I thought of designing a form of a chaise or a chair that would fit the curvature of the body of its user, but also fit the pain profile or the physiological profile of the pressure map of that user. And so the idea was to 3D print an entire chaise where structure and skin are integrated into one system, much like a leaf, um, and then vary the properties of stiffness and softness across the entirety of the chair. If you look closely, you can see the soft silicon bumps that support the pressure map of the body. So how do these ideas from product design now translate to medical applications? I suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome. It's a compression on the median nerve, it results in um, a lot of pain, um, but also um, muscle damage and weakness, numbness. Um, what you can, unfortunately, what you can buy online are highly, non-highly customizable splints. Um, and so here the idea was, and I've been fortunate enough to work with a wonderful professor of material science, Professor C Craig Carter, from the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT, and we've came up with a method to draw a pain map of a patient um, on sort of the unfolded version of the hand, and then to apply it back to the form of a glove. So instead of wearing one size splint, you can adapt the softness and the stif stiffness of the, the splint to allow or not allow for certain lateral movements of the wrist. This also requires that we think about ways in which to generate, ways about, for instance, to 3D print those splints. Um, and I'm working on a new invention uh, that uh, prints the 3D, 3D prints with variable property. So what I've tried to show is this range, a very, very brief plethora of projects that move from art to artifice to an apparatus from art to design to technological innovation. And, um, and, and I think the one point that I'd like you to take out of this would be to think uh, of an idea as a designer, designer, an idea, and then to apply this idea on many, many levels and many, many disciplines. And so in this instance, um, 
the idea of material variation and property variation across the product, whether it is a medical product, a piece of furniture, a type of new material, or a type of new technology, it all follows the same system or the same rules that are applied to the system. And finally, I wanted to end with uh, uh, a worldview of, a, of sorts um, and to juxtapose those two models, um, the model of the machine and the model of nature. Uh, the idea that uh, today we're so fascinated uh, and we're, we're fascinated with what ecological design, what sustainable design actually means. But we keep on designing systems with components that are static instead of looking into systems that grow, systems that adapt, systems that reconfigure. Uh, we keep on burning oil while when we look into nature, nature transforms um, light into sugar, right? So there's certain things that we must learn from nature when we think about our materials and the products that we design. And it is very much a material revolution. I believe we're moving away from the information age into the next revolution, the next material revolution, where information and material are going to be one. Um, and that is, I believe, the next internet or nature 2.0. Um, and so, so, I'd, so I'd like to take us to the next revolution and to think of, um, to think of material distribution, not of material assembly, to think of new ways um, to begin to talk about growth and reconfer reconfigurability in everything that we make, in everything that we use, in everything that we produce. So thank you and welcome to the next revolution.